Hi, everyone that is coming in. It's good to see all of you facilitators and friends of Mending the Soul. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm going to give everybody a couple more minutes to log in, so just hang tight. Um, we're also live on Facebook today again. So everybody on Facebook, feel free to um, ask questions there. Let me know if you have questions there. And we'll get started in just a few minutes. So for people that are flowing in at the bottom of the hour, and um, we're just holding on for everyone to join us and we will get started right at 530, which is one minute away. I'm glad you all made it despite the time change. You all changed and we didn't here in Arizona, which is confusing for all of us, most of all Arizonans. <laughs> so. I'm just trying to pull up Facebook so that I can watch you there. Okay. All right. Okay. So Good. Welcome everyone to the webinar number three in our fall series. We are going to be talking today about the role of emotions in your healing journey. So it might seem self-explanatory, but um, I think it'll be an interesting webinar. And, and definitely if you're a facilitator, something you can use. And if you're somebody that's just starting your journey, um, you found Mending the Soul online and you're wondering what is this and how uh, might this apply to me? Um, this will be helpful to you as you begin thinking about your emotions related to any kind of hurts or wounds that you have from the past. And if you have kids, this can be really, really helpful as well. Um, you can use some of this with them. A lot of what I'm going to be pulling from is from Dan Siegel's book. And I know you guys always ask for the names of my books and I don't always know. So let me find the name of this book really quickly. Um, but Dan Siegel does a lot of really good work. He does the whole brain child, which is probably one of his more well-known ones. This one is called the healing power of emotion. And it's a pretty academic read in terms of therapeutic language and neurobiology and all of that stuff. Um, it's basically about neuroscience and how your emotions relate to um, neurobiology and how that um, engages the brain, how it impedes and promotes healing of trauma. So that's, again, the name of the book is The Healing Power of Emotion by Dan Siegel. So it's my main resource for what we're gonna be talking about today. I wanna just talk about the different stages of processing trauma and the phases of trauma recovery. We look at this in three different, in three different phases. The first is safety and stabilization. And this can occur any time from about three to six months outside of the, the event, if it's a single event, um, and beyond. Um, and this is really more about dealing with emotional regulation. So you may have heard that if someone has a response that is emotionally way bigger than what this situation calls for, but typically you're seeing a trauma response, and that can be a big indicator that the person has undealt with stuff um, or that you have undealt with stuff. So um, a an example of this might be, um, I'm a mom, so everything relates to parenting to me these days. Um, kid spills the milk on the table, and instead of going, oh, that's okay, everybody makes messes, we'll clean it up. The response might be, what did you do? What are you thinking? You're so stupid. 
which is not only abusive, but also a sign that mom may not have dealt with some stuff that she's got carrying around on the inside. So the safety and st stabilization phase is about teaching that person how to regulate emotions, how to feel that overwhelming response um, come up and how to regulate that before it turns into an abusive response or an unhealthy response. Emotional overwhelm really deals with um, what's happening on the inside for that person. So our brains just start to shut off. When it begins to be too much for us to bear emotionally, we are really well-designed creatures. And in order to protect us, our brains will just shut that off and we might dissociate, which means that we kind of turn off the part of our brain that's the feeling part and we just go somewhere else. So this, you might have experienced, you know, driving home from work and getting home, pulling in the garage and going, I don't remember any of that drive. How did I not get in an accident? You might have dissociated during that drive. Or um, you might think, I wonder if I did the laundry and then you realize you've hung it all up. Um, those are all signs of dissociation. You might just detach and, um, just totally disengaged from the people around you. They'll be talking to you and you're daydreaming. Um, there's a lot of different ways that your brain can shut off so that the emotions are no longer overwhelming and you're really not engaging on an emotional level and really not present in the here and now with people that are around you. But once you've done that, once you're safe, you're safe, you're able to regulate your emotions, you can actually talk about the events without going into hyper arousal or hypo arousal, which we've talked about in previous sessions. Um, then we move into mindfulness. And this is kind of a buzzword these days. Um, and that's because there's a lot of research around it that didn't exist prior to the 1990s. And that research is telling us that the practice of mindfulness can decrease anxiety and depression. And it really does have a healing mechanism to it that allows you to pay attention to yourself in a particular way that has a healing agent. So this is really almost looking from the outside in, what is happening for me right now? What am I feeling? Where is this coming from? When have I felt like this before? Just really paying attention um, with intention, paying attention with intention to ourselves. And then the final stage is self-compassion, coming to a place where we're able to not only um, be mindful of ourselves and see ourselves, but we are able to be kind to our, towards ourselves and understand um, our motivations, understand our triggers, and be compassionate about those things. And the outcome of self-compassion really is an increased capacity to care for others. And this is the biblical uh, principle of bearing one another's burdens, right? So that's the end goal is to be able to be healthy enough to be in relationship with others. Um, in a way that represents um, what we believe is the true design of relationship from a biblical standpoint. I'm sorry about that lighting. When I lean back, it wants to make me orange. It's like, it could be a game. Um, so I apologize for that. And I move a lot. So I'll try to keep it simple. Um, contextualization of emotion is really important. So when I say, if you see an emotional response that seems bigger than necessary for the situation, that's different for a two-year-old than it is for an 80-year-old, right? So a two-year-old has bigger emotions than an 80-year-old should. The display of emotion is bigger. Um, what is earth-shattering to a two, five, seven-year-old is not earth-shattering, shattering, should not be to a 27-year-old. Vice versa, if someone dies and the person who is grieving is 27, they're going to have a really different cognitive understanding of what death means. And that is probably going to have a bigger impact on them right away than it would a two-year-old. Um, because a two-year-old doesn't necessarily understand death. So context is important. Age and developmental stage is part of that. Um, the relationship. What's the relationship to the feeling? What's the relationship between the people um, in which the event occurred? Um, was the harmful event between husband and wife or strangers? Those context is really important. Um, I should be way more upset about something my husband says that's hurtful than something a stranger says to me. They're both hurtful, um, but the relationship there is actually really important. And if I am over responding to things that are outside of those really intimate integral, important relationships, that may, there may be a reason for that. Um, 
culture, what's the cultural context that this situation is taking place in? What's normal in one culture might not be normal in another culture. Um, what's really hurtful in one culture might not be in another culture. Um, what is the event? What's the trauma? What's the processing and healing? So being aware of what the context of the emotion is, is actually really helpful to understanding its overall impact. And I'm just doing some cursory stuff here and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of, of what does this mean? So this is a big one. I've noticed recently in my conversations with clients and with many of the soul people, um, uh, the use of negative and positive emotions and this overarching feeling that there are emotions that are good for us and there are emotions that are bad for us. And maybe even that we're not actually supposed to be emotional. And so I want to challenge that language a little bit and our understanding of what that means. So, um, just generally speaking, positive emotions, we would categorize those as being joy, interest, enthusiasm, laughter, empathy, action, curiosity, anticipation, pride, desire, and hope. And negative emotions, we might put in that column, apathy, grief, fear, hatred, shame, blame, regret, resentment, hostility, anger, and despair. So I 100% get why someone would say these are positive emotions and these are negative emotions because the positive ones are a whole lot more fun to feel. They're a whole lot more fun to experience for the most part. Um, and the negative ones hurt. And so we're going to call those negative. But I would like to posit that perhaps there is no value, positive or negative. I, my husband's a CPA. So when I hear positive and negative, I think deficit and, you know, savings and and you spent too much. Um, I don't think it's the case with emotions. If we fail to experience grief, we will never heal a loss. If we fail to experience fear, we will step into danger every time. So fear is really positive because fear warns us of danger. Um, if we never experience regret, I wonder if we've learned anything. Um, if we are never angry, we actually aren't even experiencing the same emotions as Jesus. Jesus got very angry. Um, I would say Jesus even despaired um, in the garden when he was praying. Um, maybe not in the same way we despair, but he was for sure sad and he was sure heart heavy. Um, so I think a perspective shift in the labeling of positive and negative and just calling them emotions is sometimes necessary when we're learning to feel the things that are more socially considered negative emotions, especially for those of us that have been trained that there are only two acceptable emotions, anger and happiness, and everything else is not allowed. I liked this picture here of the big bad wolf and the three little piggies in their house of straw. And that anxiety and depression somehow have the power to blow this house of positive emotion down. And I'm sure for anybody that has struggled with those emotions, anxiety and depression, that that feels tremendously true and weighty. And so if I allow the train to start moving in the direction of depression and anxiety, if I allow those emotions to come in, I risk losing the traction I've gained in building fun and hope and desire and happiness. And we're going to talk about how that may or may not be true and how to challenge that. Um, but I want to just say it's understandable that that would be a fear. If I step off into this abyss of sadness and if I step off into this abyss of pain and if I grieve the loss of parents that were loving and kind, if I grieve the loss of a childhood full of innocence instead of trauma, will it ever stop? And I think it will. In my experience, it does. So let's talk about how emotion actually helps us find an end to some of those things. So what does it mean to stay with an emotion? A lot of times, if you've had any therapy, your therapist might say, stay with it, stay with that. When you start to cry and your initial response might be, um, no thanks, <laughs> I'd rather not stay with this emotion. Um, but what does that mean? I know that a lot of times I hear participants and facilitators and even my clients say, I just don't want to be sad anymore. I just don't want to feel this way anymore. Um, why can't I just stay happy? 
Um, when will I ever be happy? How do I make the pain stop? I want to stop being angry. So all of these are a desire to come out of what feels like a really negative emotional space. And I wonder if the reality is, is that in these cases, that the emotion has not been acknowledged tied to the experience or the event, but it's a sadness in general. I'm sad that I'm not this, um, not I'm grieving the loss of innocence. Um, because truly, once we acknowledge those emotions and we allow ourselves to actually feel it, we can begin to heal it. Um, if and until you acknowledge your own emotions, their context, which we talked about earlier, their impact, and actually feel those feelings, you will continue to fight this tug of war with them. So my sense often is, is for people who are trying to escape the negative feelings that they are afraid of, they haven't really felt those feelings. They haven't cried for themselves. They haven't reached the point of compassion for self. And so they're in this tug of war of, I refuse to be stuck in this place. And they're pulling on this. And meanwhile, the wound is pulling on this and it creates this tension. And it's that tension that is so uncomfortable. Um, Dan Siegel says, consider a time, and I'd like you to do this if you're watching, to go ahead and do this with me. Consider a time in the recent past when you felt emotional. So just consider the word emotion and what that means to you. It might be good, it might be bad. Um, what was that experience like for you? How did your state of being impact others around you? What happened before you became emotional? And what was the outcome of that emotional experience? So as you consider that, I want you to think that perhaps the state of being emotional is the most human thing that you could experience. Because to be unemotional is to be not the way God created us to be. But all of these questions are questions that we would also ask as we process our trauma. What was the experience like? What was the impact of how we reacted? What happened before? What happened during? And what was the outcome? So these are all things that as we become mindful, we're going to keep considering. And that is really how we stay with the emotion. And once we do that, we move into this wonderful phase called, tra called transformation where that wound gets acknowledged, it's, the pain of it is felt, its impact is identified, and we begin to heal and transform. And transformation, I love the way Dan Siegel says this, he says, transformation feels as if some basic architecture is being remodeled rather than just new furniture being put in the house or moved from room to room. There's a deep structural change, even if quite subtle, that alters the backbone of existence. So I can really see this in my own life. Um, I'm curious if you can see it in yours as you have walked through healing, if you have it all. Um, this is the difference between playing whack-a-mole with your defense mechanisms and actually experiencing real change in your reactions. So one of the reasons the amending the soul model works and other models like it is that we are not changing behaviors to impact emotion. We are acknowledging our emotions and healing wounds so that our behaviors will change, so that we can have new life. And that is an architectural change. That's tearing, that's Joanna Gainsing our souls, right? That's changing the function of the rooms, how the structure is built, where the supporting beams are. We're not just moving the couch from one room to another. Practically speaking, what that might look like is, I go to a group and I say, I wanna deal with my anger. I just don't wanna be angry anymore. I find I'm yelling at everybody. And that's a trauma response. So we go to CR and we do the 12 steps and we figure out how to not yell at people. And then we find that we are eating a ton and we've gained like 40 pounds. And the reason for that is, is because you can't actually just change your behavior. <laughs> your systems are hardwired to be fully integrated, your body, mind, and soul. And you might be able to stop yelling at somebody, but your body is going to make it necessary for you to find another way to deal with that feeling that was causing the anger, with that wound that was causing the anger. So until that wound is really dealt with and the emotions are felt and acknowledged, 
the behaviors will be create a whack-a-mole situation where, okay, well now I need to go to an overeaters group because I'm not angry anymore, but now Hagen Doss and I are best friends. And then you might get that under control, but then maybe you cheat on your husband. So these behaviors will keep popping up until you actually deal with the emotions that are causing them. And so I said a word there called integration, which is really the, the ultimate goal that we're working towards as trauma survivors. And that is a full integration of body, mind, and soul. So um, we believe at Mending the Soul in a biblical model where humans are created in the image of God. And that means that we have three parts. We have a body that's physical and flesh. We have a mind that thinks and reasons. This is our cognitive center that is able to make decisions and um, practice ethics and raise children and do math and all of those wonderful things. And we have a spirit, we have a soul. And that is the part that connects us to others and connects us to God. And that is the part that really gets wounded um, deep down inside when we experience trauma. And da Dan Siegel says, in short, emotions play a creative role in the re regulation and development of an individual's cognitions and learning throughout life. And so this is like from infancy on, so the emotions that an infant experiences changes the way that their cognitive development processes develop. So if they experience a lot of neglect and a lot of um, unmet emotional need as, as young as three, four months old, it will change the way that they develop cognitively. So emotions actually have a really creative and dynamic part of how our brains function. We also know that undealt with emotion can cause physical illness. Um, you may have experienced this in the form of headaches or bowel dumping. We also call that diarrhea in my house where you might have a huge conflict and then find yourself in the bathroom unable and you think, oh, I must have gotten the stomach flu. And yet every time I have an interaction with so-and-so, I get the stomach flu. <laughs> I don't know why that is. So this is actually a really interesting dynamic that we have learned in our um, enlightenment, post-enlightenment world that we can just treat a, psych, a psychoanalytical approach where we're just talking about our feelings. But if we don't have this full integration, we're actually not dealing with the main problem, which is that trauma disintegrates us. It separates those things. So when a child or an adult experiences trauma, it actually shuts off the creative centers of the brain. It shuts off creativity. It shuts off imagination. It shuts off the part of your brain that's able to process a lot of that in a creative way to help you deal with it. So some of the things that we're going to talk about in terms of um, processing emotion are going to be how to reintegrate those three parts. When trauma survivors experience this disintegration, and it might be through dis dissociation or another um, detachment mechanism that your brain uses, um, healing requires a reintegration of the right and left hemispheres. Dan Siegel says that in dissociation prone individuals, a trauma that is perceived and processed by the right hemisphere will lead to a disruption in the usually integrated functions of consciousness. So if the right part of your brain is the one taking this trauma in, the left part will say, I'm out. I'm completely separating. I'm not going to have an integrated approach to this. So this is the equivalent of when Dan Siegel talks about flipping your lid. So you have the feeling part of your brain and the cognitive part of your brain. This is the part that makes decisions. This is the part that freaks out when you have trauma that goes into fight or flight. And he talks about when you are triggered, you flip your lid and this cognitive part of your brain just isn't functioning anymore. The only thing in control is this emotional part. So that's kind of what he's saying here is that it's a complete disintegration. The parts of your brains that are designed to work together for full functioning are no longer working. So emotional processing, the role of emotions is to help you reintegrate so that your whole system is working towards healing. Sensory motor activities. So these are, these are body movements that you can do to help re-engage your brain and integrate your brain. So if you happen to be hypo aroused, which means that you might be depressed, you might be lethargic, you might feel very tired and sleepy. If you find yourself in a many in the soul group and you're yawning and you are having trouble staying awake and you're having trouble paying attention, 
this might be you. Um, turn on the lights in the room, make it brighter. Louder, upbeat music to keep, to um, activate your system. Um, you might hold a plank for 60 seconds, probably not in the middle of a group, but if you find that that's you, you might do it before group. Um, jumping rope, going for a walk, run, or jog, whatever you're capable of doing. You might take a stability ball and sit on that during group and bounce on it if you're able during group to keep yourself activated. Another way to do this would be to dance. Um, oftentimes just leaving the house if you struggle with depression can be a huge step in um, activating your system. If you have the opposite problem and you tend to be hyper aroused and you need to relax, um, you might want to turn the lights down in the room. You might want to play soft music. You might want to rock in your chair instead of bounce. You might want to do some yoga or stretching, take a warm bath, use aromatherapy or even massage. And once you've done that, um, you're going to want to take an assessment of your body. So the first step in re-engaging is to relax or activate so that you are within um, this window of tolerance where you are neither, neither high nor low, you're right where you should be. And we've talked a little bit about mindfulness in these webinars before. And what this looks like really is you saying, what is happening for me physically? So sometimes in group when someone shares, I might start to feel a real heaviness on my chest. I might, to start, to, might start to feel anxiety myself when I'm listening to their story. Um, when I'm sharing my own story, if I start to feel anxious, the first thing I wanna do is think about where I'm feeling it in my body. So I tend to feel anxiety in my chest as a tightening or as a weight. I tend to feel it, I find that my shoulders are hunched up and tight. Um, I might get a tension headache, things like that. So you wanna ask yourself, once you are, have done these exercises and you feel um, that you have gotten your body re-engaged. Ask yourself, where do you feel that? What do you feel? Go back to those original questions of what is the emotion? What is the impact of the emotion? What happened right before this? What happened right after? And just take stock of that internally. Some other activities that you can do to help re-engage the creative centers of your brain, which are res hugely responsible for a lot of healing work, is you might paint, you might draw, you might write a letter with your non-dominant hand. If you're really struggling with getting through the exercises in the Mending the Soul curriculum or one of your participants is, you might have them do it in their non-dominant hand. And the reason for that is, is it actually engages the, the opposite side of the brain and they are able to access some of those um, memories and feelings that they're unable to access with just their cognitive brain. So the thing to help you remember this is that creative plus cognitive is whole brain, which is what we're looking for is this integration. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. And I had gone on the Facebook page here I don't see any questions, but I do want to say if you have questions real quick about the presentation so far, you can type them into the Q&A box or you can type them into the Facebook page and I will answer those questions there. If your questions are specifically um, facilitator oriented, then I will answer those in the Facebook page once we are done with the webinar. Um, if they are general about the role of emotion and healing, you can go ahead and ask them here. So does anybody have any questions? You can use the Q&A or you can use uh, Facebook. There is also a chat window that you can use. Any questions about emotions, how they relate to your healing? I know this was a pretty high level discussion, but I'm curious if you have any questions about what, what it all means. Like if I can clarify anything. No? Okay, there we go. Maintaining it, Sherry. So Sherry says, can you talk about maintaining a level of negative emotion. Yes. So um, 
this might look like um, when I ask myself those questions, when I go back to these questions that Dan Siegel posits, hang on, let me pull them up. I'm on two screens and I'm also going blind. Okay. Nope. Nope. What was the experience like? How did your state of being impact others? If I just go back to what was that experience like? If I ask that question about any of the traumatic events in my past, I immediately have an emotional response. And it's not positive, <laughs> I'll say that. And so if I stay with that, in the beginning, I might only be able to do it for five to 10 seconds because it's too painful. And it's gonna look like me crying and then suddenly my brain will just shut off. So I'm sure you've seen this, Sherry, in running your groups where somebody gets super emotional and then they go, okay, I'm fine. You wanna say, and even say to yourself if that's you, can you stay with that just a little bit longer? And the way I think about it is, the little girl that all that stuff happened to was never allowed to feel those feelings. And those feelings didn't disappear and evaporate like air. They're deep down inside and that they, they deserve to be felt. So the way I allowed myself to do that is I slowly created space to give permission to the little girl to feel her feelings. And mentally that allowed me to not see it as me as an adult boohooing over the past, which we're told not to do, but as me allowing that little girl to have the time and the space and the safety to feel the feelings she didn't get to feel 35 years ago. And slowly but surely, I was able to let her cry for five, 10 minutes at a time. Um, and then she even got angry sometimes and was able to get really mad, um, which she wasn't allowed to do as a little girl. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. I mean, even in, in the cases of, um, let's say, a sexual rape um, as an adult, in those moments of being violated, you're not able to feel your feelings. You're just trying to survive. And so it's good and right that at some point that person that was violated have space that's safe to feel the feelings that were happening at that time. Does that help, Sherry? Okay. Something thinking. Okay, check Facebook. What is the title of the book? Again, hang on, Jean. Healing, the Healing Power of Emotion by Dan Siegel. That's the name of the book. Anybody else have questions? Okie dokie. So I have one more thing to share with you guys before you take off, please don't leave. So you may have gotten an email in your mail in your e in your email box, which is where we typically get our emails. Um, in regards to the Mending the Soul campaign, typically this time of year we have a fundraiser here in Phoenix or in Portland, and we are not doing that this year. Um, we are doing this instead. So we are doing a big um, campaign this month called the Gift of Redemption. Uh, we have a fifty thousand dollar match that it is promised to us. So for every dollar up to 50,000, we, um, it's worth two. Um, and we are, have a goal of $100,000. So if you weren't aware, yes, we sell books, we do all of those things, but a large majority of our operating costs is raised through donations. Um, you'll be getting weekly updates from our website and in your email, if we have your email from direct, directly from um, Dr. Tracy, he's done some taped messages for everyone. Um, a lot of the things that we're doing um, are gonna be covered in a webinar that I'm hosting on the 6th at 6 p.m. Arizona time, and I'll record that and we will have that posted for you as well. But I'm gonna be talking about all of the things that we're doing. Um, as you know, we've, we've got some new initiatives, we're doing a lot of new things. There's big things happening in Africa um, and domestically, and we're really just trying to be equipped for um, what has been a real huge uptick in interest for the services that we offer and the ministries that we provide. So, and we have new curriculum coming out soon. 
Um, and I'm excited to be able to share that with you soon as well. So if you're interested in what else is going on in Mending the Soul, you can join me on Wednesday or watch the recording. So November the 6th at 6 p.m. Arizona time, and that'll be posted to our website soon. Um, if you would like to donate, you can go to this URL, mendingthesoul.org, the gift dash of dash redemption dash 2019 and um, donate there. Every penny counts. You can give a one-time donation. You can give a monthly donation. Um, questions about giving and what that looks like and what we're raising money for. Anything I can answer there? Any other questions about the webinar content? Thank you, Susan and Jean. All right, guys. Ladies and gents, thank you for joining me this evening. I will see you all in a couple weeks. If you...